Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Between Whiskey and Ammonia, our podcast, the very first episode. My name is Drew Shapiro. I'm here with my co-host, Nick Hatt. Uh, a lot of you are probably wondering uh, why we chose this name. And I think ultimately it boils down to uh, a lot happens in a man's life between his first drink and his last. And uh, we're going to have everything on the table here. And uh, we're going to talk about all of it. So Absolutely. Absolutely. No holes barred. So, Nick, why don't you introduce yourself, let everybody know what you're about, why we're uh, here today. All right. My name is Nick Hatt. Uh, I own a construction company. I've had a long, long, long 39 years. Um, and Drew and I are good friends, and we talk about a lot of things, both professional and personal. And uh, we agree that we both can help each other and help others, and others can we still have a lot to learn ourselves. So here we are. Yeah, without a doubt. And I, I think uh, this is one of those things we've been talking about doing for a long time. And uh, very recently, I had a near-death experience of my own uh, with COVID. I uh, turned to uh, pneumonia, 33 years old. Uh, and sometimes life throws you curveballs, gives you some perspective that uh, you didn't know you were missing. And uh, frankly, uh, as I was lying there in the hospital thinking about all the things I wish I might have done differently or wanted to apologize for or things I had left uh, left to do and things that were unfinished, uh, this podcast was definitely one of them. So that's where pneumonia comes from. And, yeah, and the, <laughs> and the whiskey is something that we, we both enjoy. So, Without okay. a doubt, without a doubt. So, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of different things that have brought us to where we are today, uh, make us who we are, uh, and, and it's nice to be able to control the narrative. You know, from a background in uh, finance, I started my practice when I was 18 years old, uh, to running for the school board when I was 23, uh, Genesee County Commission, uh, a run for state house. Um, a lot of those things really shaped who I am today. I think there's a lot of lessons that uh, could be learned from that. And, um, you know, we're here to talk about it all. And, you know, for once, uh, control the narrative. You know, we go on the radio sometimes in those positions. We go on TV, things get edited and portrayed a certain way. And, I think it's nice to be able to sit down in this format and uh, tell it how it is and be authentic and put everything on the table. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The same, almost, almost the same for me. You know, I have a, have a lot to say. <laughs> um, but, no, I have a little bit different upbringing. Um, the oldest of four kids, I got out of high school and went to the Army. I didn't, didn't go quite as far in the Army as I would like to, but... Uh, Got out of there and started in the construction industry. Quickly made it to always be in the foreman, always be in the superintendent. And uh, one day just decided to go out on my own and got involved in a little bit of politics, which is how you and I met and kicked it off. And, and here we are. We're doing well, great. Doing I think great. we'll get to the, the story of how you and I met a little later <laughs> on. But, uh, you know, I think uh, I was listening to Jocko the other day. And he said, you know, with all the the reasons people join the military and duty and honor and the the noble causes uh, such as that, I think uh, he said he just really wanted a machine gun. So Uh, (laughs) I'd love to hear what what Um, that journey was like, what prompted you to uh, um, to enlist. And for me, it was, uh, well, I wanted to go into the Navy. I wanted to go into naval intelligence. And uh, once 9-11 took place, I immediately shifted from, you know, the smart Navy job to I'm going to go blow shit up and <laughs> decided to be uh, 19 kilo. I was on an M1 Abrams tank and it was, it was a good time. So what was it like uh, when you got to basic? Scary. <laughs> it was scary. I was uh, 19 years old, 18 years old and I hadn't left Montrose, Michigan. Um, and all of a sudden it was, it was it was it was pretty intense. It was pretty intense. Um, some of the some of the stuff was I was used to. My mom was uh, quite strict at times, but for the most most part it was it was scary just because you know we joined and we knew that the guys that were in the combat MOSs you were going. So um, unfortunately, I didn't uh, I didn't make it as far as some of the other guys. Better 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 guys than I. Um, but it was it was fun. What year was that? 2001. Wow. So before or after? Uh, after. 
after I, I switched to the Army in October of 2001, and I shipped out to Fort Knox in January of 2002. Wow, so after, obviously, being September 11th. It, yeah, after. after yeah. So I think a lot of people would have had a desire to blow things up Yep. after that. So yep, yep. That's relatable. I think I was in eighth grade at the point, so unable to, but uh, I always had a desire at a young age to go to the Naval Academy. That didn't happen. Uh, I decided to go to Central Michigan University and set instead. Um, like drinking beer and you know all the things that go along with uh, going to college. So... Uh, that that kind of shaped things, but they also had a great personal financial planning degree, which I pursued for a while. And uh, not that we can uh, can change the past, but I, I certainly wouldn't. Um, so, tell me about you know your career, you know after the uh, stint in the army and well, um, I got out of the army. I was medically discharged. Uh, I didn't I didn't make it past the sixteen weeks required to be a tanker. So that that really sucked. And I also knew, you know, like you said, you went to college, wanted to go to Central Michigan. I, I had absolutely zero interest in anything college. Um, got out of the Army, took a job at the auto parts store. Uh, was talking to my cousin, and uh, at the time he worked for worked for a concrete company, pouring driveways, sidewalks, things like that. And uh, he said, come come hang out with me. <laughs> and uh, that good summer job turned into uh, – Turned into a lifelong thing, uh, so. But in doing in doing that type of work, I knew that I knew that I wasn't uh, I wasn't going to be just one of the guys. I wanted to be the guy, so started my own thing, and and it's worked out great. I've had a tremendous opportunity to work with a lot of good, lot of good guys, a lot of good guys, and they've all helped in ways they can't even imagine. So, and it's been great. As for, I'd say, all of us, it's a long road to get to where we are today. It, it is. And uh, it is. I know I worked jobs uh, through high school, always wanted a job, always wanted to make money uh, as soon as I could, you know, putting flyers and mailboxes around my parents' neighborhood. Uh, I believe they said, uh, we'll work for money. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And uh, rake leaves, watch your dog, um, pick up weeds in the garden, things like that. And, you know, through high school, I certainly worked uh Plenty of jobs where I had to shower twice to not smell like bacon. I know my mom often made me uh, leave my line cook clothes in the garage before she'd even let me in the house. And at that point in time, I really decided, hey, this isn't something I want to do forever. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. can certainly fry some eggs real well. Did so this morning, but uh, I don't want to make a career out of that. Nothing against those, those who do because that's real work. But uh, along the way, there have definitely been people who said to me, it must be nice. Mm, yeah. And I'm never yeah. really quite sure how to <laughs> my, take that. My, my favorite statement of all, it must be nice. Um, you know, I once had that mindset about guys that I worked for and guys that I seen that were doing you know better than I. And I, I think it's important to not be in competition with anybody other than yourself. And, uh, you know, the guys that say that to me now, it's like, you know, you go home at, at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon hang out, go to your pool, have a, have a cocktail or two. I usually go back to the office and I'm there until eight, nine o'clock at night, you know, trying to plan next week, not just tomorrow or next month, you know? So, um, that, that, that statement to me is, is complete bullshit. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not, uh, usually not well received. Yeah. A lot of people I think just focus on the end result and, uh, the ultimate success that comes with it. We are definitely a satisfaction now culture, unfortunately. Oh, certainly. And we talk about that all the time uh, with what yep. I do and, and yep. how it's yep. so difficult to balance yep. uh, and deal with today's fixation on immediate gratification. Uh, just getting through the holidays, especially you know, seeing people uh, do things they wouldn't normally do, uh, yep. leverage debt uh, they wouldn't uh, normally or reasonably leverage. Uh, to prove their love uh, to people. And uh, yeah. from a, a professional standpoint, that's challenging for me to watch how people prioritize things. And a lot of times, even when people become successful in business, how uh, they continue to fail to prioritize. Yeah. Uh, I think we had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe once or twice. Uh, aside from that, you know, I would say 
when I got to Central Michigan University, uh, it, it was really interesting. You know, there were kids who were so upset to be uh, away from home uh, that they were uh, distraught, crying, um, you know, extremely um, unhappy to be there. And I recall walking out of my dorm, and no disrespect, Mom, because I know you're going to be listening to this, but as soon as my mom and dad pulled off, I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm finally, mm-hmm. fr- I'm finally free. <laughs> this, this is great. Game on. And uh, it's funny because the education system and the way it is today, uh, I thought, uh, along with a lot of other people, hey, go to college, get good grades, and you'll get a great job that will pay you great wages, and you're, you're set for life. And unfortunately, uh, oftentimes that doesn't translate into real-world success. I went to school with so many people who graduated top 10 in the class, and you know, I, I was nowhere near that. Uh, and, and they're not in a position today that you would have thought back then because I feel our education system has really failed our students. And you know, back to my history a little bit, uh, that's why I decided to run for school board you know, when I was 23 years old. I beat a multiple-term incumbent, another challenger. I was the only candidate uh, that didn't have kids. And I recall a lot of people asking me, hey, why are you running for school board? And I I said, hey, I I see all these people and all my friends and all my peers who were made this promise of go to school, get good grades, go to school, get good grades, go to school, get good grades. Okay, well, I'm done with school. There's no more good grades to get. What do I do now? Right. And how many times have you seen situations like that? Um, a, a lot, a lot. I've worked with a lot of guys that had college degrees that ended up being concrete finishers and, and, and their college degrees were, were, it, it, they just, uh, didn't materialize for them after high school or after college rather, uh, because during high school, um, yeah, that's, that's what they were pushing, you know, go to college, go to college, go to college, go to college. In fact, you know, most of the time, if you're talking about being a construction worker, they're like, why in the world would you ever want to do that? You know? Um, so it, it was, I think it was, it, it's great for some people. It's great for a lot of professions, but it's definitely not for everybody. And it was not for me. Yeah. There's well, no way. <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> no think I it, it, I don't think it can be. And I think a lot of people who didn't go to college, who aren't saddled with uh, the ridiculous amounts of student debt that we see today. I think it's second only to uh, mortgage debt. I could be wrong, but uh, yeah, watching them try to overcome that now, uh, they'll be paying it off for a lifetime. And going into the trades and doing those things uh, that don't require a college education, I, again, you get an education that's totally different. And I yeah. talk to people uh, yeah. all the time. Um, who haven't gone to college, who make much better financial decisions than the people who did and are in a position now because of the lack of student debt to make those decisions. And it's really interesting to see that play out. And a lot of the times you see people uh, come into my office who a lot of folks would think would be great clients. Um, and that's not always necessarily the case, you know, uh, because there is such a fixation in our society today with uh, immediate gratification and the symbols of wealth and uh, not true wealth. And again, I have a whole lot left to learn. Uh, It's always funny. I run into people uh, who've been in this career a really long time who feel like they don't have anything left to learn. So, Mm. you know, what was maybe one point in time where you thought you knew exactly what you were doing and maybe every it day, and, and, I, <laughs> and I have one specific one in mind personally, but uh, you know maybe uh, there was a bid at one point uh, that you won uh, when you after you started your own business that said, "Hey, you know maybe I can I can really do this. This can really work." Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was tough starting out. Um, I knew a lot of people, but I always knew a lot of people as. Nick, the guy who works for this guy. So it was tough coming into their office saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to, this is, this is my company and I'm going to do this. And some of them took me seriously. Some of them didn't. The ones that, the ones that did and gave me an opportunity, uh, yeah, I'm thankful for that. And, and, you know, once the first couple bids came through, it was like, wow, you know, 
it's this uh this is a thing i'm gonna take and roll with it and i think the the biggest challenge is to not not get content with it so 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 you said your first job was at the auto parts store uh no i worked at the auto parts store when i got out of the army Uh, as far as bids go the first the first big bid that i got and landed was uh williams gun site and then immediately after that davison school well that's a story Um, we both love yes all the time all the time absolutely that's great i know uh I wanted to go into finance, you know, like a good Jewish boy. Uh, when I was 13, I took all my bar mitzvah money and invested in Apple computer at $23 and 16 cents a share. Uh, I wish I could say I still own it today. Right. Uh, but like most 18 year olds, uh, I put that towards a new vehicle, uh, a depreciating asset. So yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think about that often, but uh, certainly don't regret it. Certainly can't change it. And that put me on a path. Uh, where I knew I wanted to pursue finance at that point. And I got to give a shout out to Mr. Burwitz at Fenton High School uh, for his finance class, uh, having us write a paper on a new form of technology, which at the time was the iPod, not the iPhone, yeah, right. not, the, uh, not the iPad, but the iPod um, is what prompted me to do that and, and set me on this path uh, to where I am today. And uh, really, you know, I got to college and didn't realize, you know, how truly fortunate I was growing up. You're exposed to things uh, you've never been exposed to before. Some good, some bad, some exciting, some not. Uh, algebra class was always a challenge, ironically, for a, for a finance guy. But, uh, you know, I knew from a early time that uh, I wanted to run my own practice, uh, pave my own way, never really much enjoyed being an employee, had done plenty of that through line cook and busboy jobs. And, uh, you know, when did it click with you that, hey, I don't want to be an employee anymore? Uh, I would say probably somewhere around 2010. Um, but unfortunately at the time, I, I don't know. It, it took me a minute to gain the, uh, gain the self-confidence, self-esteem to get it done. Um, but, yeah, I, I like I said, I'm the oldest of – oldest of four and I think everybody who's ever known me would be agreed that I don't like being told what to do. So, (laughs) so, uh, yeah, being my own boss was definitely the way to go. Absolutely. I think a lot of people desire to get to that point and there's always an excuse. There's always a reason. And and I had all the same excuses, the same reasons not to, I had all the people telling me, Oh, well, you know, the economy, this, and the, you know, the winter months, you guys can't pour in the winter time. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be this. Every reason you could think of to not, you know, plant your own flag. And there was a few guys, a few guys that said, you know, don't listen to them. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And it worked great. It worked great. It's a, it's a constant battle. It's every single day, whether it's, you know, the guys, money, bids, contracts, Increasing cost of materials. Increasing cost of materials. Yeah, this We've past year, that. this yeah. past year has been, it's been nuts. The lumber prices were, went to double. Steel prices went to double. Um, it's been tough. It's been tough. That and the shrinking labor pool um, is another huge one. So, yeah, you know, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of people want it, and a lot of people focus on the end result. And yeah, yeah. How, how you get there necessarily isn't really a focus right no i know i know a lot of guys that a lot of guys that started off and uh they thought they were going to set the world on fire and they kind of petered out made a few mistakes few mistakes that i made i mean you know i made the same mistakes it's just that i had a had a good group of people around me to push me back on track and and keep me keep me focused so yeah i can't say enough about that it's important to have those people in your life my family certainly has had my back. Uh, my fiance Amanda stood by me through some really challenging times, uh, right. politically, especially uh, with the environment uh, the way it is today. You know, I've always felt like I could be one of these guys, or am one of these guys, who could compromise. Um, you know, find a way to accomplish what we all want to accomplish. Uh, and I think the biggest hurdle is 
we just have different ideas on the best way to get there. And, you know, unfortunately, in uh, today's political environment, um, everything has to be so cut and dry, one way or the other. Right. Yeah, there's no in between. None. None. I, I, it'd be great if we could get back to that point. Um, you know, I, I saw that when I ran for county commission, especially, and I think this goes back to the story of how we met. But yeah. The, yep. the first time. Yep. What What was your recollection of that event? Because, um, well, it was uh, before the primary. <laughs> I think it was, uh, was it Tony Brown? Yeah, I might have to have a sip for this. Yeah, Tony Brown. Yep. He was the sitting county commissioner, wasn't he? And you, he was indeed, yeah. And here comes this this young guy into our meeting to tell us all he's gonna. That try. was the the Republican Party, yes, of the county, yes, Tennessee yep. County Republican yep. Party. I had just I had just been voted on the executive committee at that time. I think I was there for, I think it was my second meeting, second or maybe third meeting. So they got something right occasionally. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But uh, <laughs> um, here comes this kid from Fenton who's gonna primary our buddy. And at the time we were you know, going over who we're going to give campaign funds to, this and that. And, uh, you know, they made sure to tell you that they were not giving you any money before the primary. And I think a direct quote was, well, look, I don't need your money. I just wanted you to know who I was. And I thought that was, I'm like, eh, all right, fair enough, you know. And then uh, you won the primary. Fast forward to the general, you won that. Uh, Pete Ponzetti. Pardon? Pete Ponzetti. In that one, Pete Ponzetti, and the general. Oh yeah, oh. on the on the left side of things. Oh. <laughs> um, but then they uh, the party had 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 turned on you. Um, I heard nothing but bad things, and uh, I figured rather than have the you know the sheep herd opinion on somebody, I'd find out for myself and. I also knew you were a financial guy, and I also knew that if I didn't get my shit together financially, I would be in a world of hurt. So I figured, well, you know, I kind of like the way the guy presented himself when I first seen him. <laughs> I've been a couple meetings since then. Uh, can't all be bad. Let's see what he has to say. So here we are. No, that's funny. I, I recall going into that meeting, I think it was at Brick Street. In yes. Grand Blank. Yep. Uh, interesting walking in there to your own party, uh, yeah. feeling like uh, the enemy. And I think one of the only reasons I showed up is they were talking about giving Tony uh, $5,000 prior to the uh, the primary election. I think it was 1500 Okay. E either way, I think they spent five on a, a sheriff election at one point that had no chance of winning. But uh, maybe that's why that number sticks in my head. But I, I said, hey, you know, what are you doing? Uh, nobody endorses or no party endorses a candidate prior to the primary election and you can give them the money if you want. But I think my exact words, or at least what I was thinking was, well, you can go ahead and do that, but you're going to be pissing in the wind. So maybe that's why we get along. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so. Um, you definitely, uh, definitely weren't taking no for an answer on that one. So no, uh, I, I don't think it would have made a difference if they had given it to him or not. And they didn't. Yep. No, no, they didn't. But, uh, you know, from the time on the school board where I actually felt like I was affecting some change, uh, became the president there after a couple of years, um, I was passionate about that. And that was a thankless job in a lot of ways. Uh, $1 a year salary, uh, but that's not why I did it, clearly. Not, not for $1, not for the salary ever running for political office. It was a genuine desire to change some things that I thought were screwed up. And again, going back to having our students prepared for the real world. And hey, what am I supposed to do when there's no more good grades to get? Because I saw so many of my friends who were so successful academically just not be able to put it together after college. Right, right. And I think a large part of that goes into, uh, I think a large part of that is, you know, our culture is so torn with, with you know, money and having money and, and appearing successful. We forget that, you know, if you're doing something that you like, like me, I love my job. Um, I always get ragged on for working so much. Well, you know, some days it's not work. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I love the shit out of it every single day. I, you know, it's, I think there's a huge disconnect there. So I think that if anybody, 
anybody who gets out of college and doesn't know what they want to do, just do what you love. Be good at it. Right. That's the only way to be good at it is to love it. So. Yeah, I can't tell you how excited I was just to be able to walk out of the hospital after spending five days in the ICU. <laughs> well, uh, you know, <laughs> 33 bet. years old, had been, you know, working out, trying to eat healthier, never expected, uh, you know, COVID um, to hit me like that and eventually, you know, turn into pneumonia. And I got out of the hospital and I said, man, I'm excited to unload the dishwasher. I'm excited to scrub right, toilets. Right. I'm excited to just be able to walk outside and get the mail. So, so many things in life, I think, are about perspective. And we get so hung up on the day-to-day or uh, the current moment, you know, the, the lack of the big-picture thought uh, for a lot of folks is probably one of our bi- biggest impediments. I mean, I know for myself, <laughs> looking back at my political track record, uh, my own worst enemy was me yeah, at, I, at many it, points in time. My and whole life, I think, probably my own worst enemy is me. But uh, you know, it, that's that's part of part of growing. Part of growing. You gotta, you know, you gotta kick your own ass every once in a while. Um, yeah, or get your ass kicked. Yeah, yeah, that's happened a couple times as well. <laughs> done there, <laughs> done that. That's happened a couple times. Done there, done that. Um, state house race in eighteen uh, and a seventeen. Uh, was certainly uh, that case for me. And, you know, it goes back to, you know, I'm a big reader. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think you put me on the path to, uh, you know, learning about uh, stoicism and right. some of these lessons right. that are right. thousands of years old that are still so relevant here today. And, you know, being able to, to own some of our mistakes and, and look at things uh, differently. And right. No, it's, it's, that's great. It's been a big help to me as well. After being divorced, so I guess I can probably align that. You know, political loss, divorce loss. Um, it was a big, big help being able to reflect on things and see what you did wrong and see ways you could have changed and not be angry about things that you don't control and 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 move on. Yeah, certainly, and uh, to create friendships with people who were former opponents. Uh, I know that's right. Something right. that's uh, really brought me a lot of peace. In the last year or so, right, and um, you know, realize that hey, you know, as cliche as it sounds, and uh, not with the COVID uh, slogan, but you know, we really are in this together um, uh, from a more broader perspective. And you know, what are we do? What are we doing? Tearing each other up with all this uh, friendly fire, all this blue on blue stuff. Right. And you know, I had that conversation, you know, after the fact uh, with my opponent in that state house race, Mike Mueller. Who I think's doing a great job right now, mm-hmm. and hey, we agree yep. on probably ninety five percent of stuff. What were we doing, tearing each other up like that, uh, when we could be combining forces and and working towards um, you know goals together? So, you know, I know eh, you're just battling at that point in time. Well, I think my you know, again, my ego was my biggest enemy. I had had some really early successes at a young age. And I look back on it now, and I wish I would have read that book, uh, Ego is the Enemy, right. as, as soon as I ran for school board, or if not uh, before, Ryan Holiday, because, and I just uh, was going to get humbled one way or another, uh, but I was so young and um, so into it, um, I wasn't even really paying attention. So certainly made some miscues, and... Again, wouldn't change it for the world. If uh, those things wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't be engaged to, you know, Amanda today. You know, so thankful for her. So it's all those mistakes have led me to be the person I am right. today. And right. everything plays everything plays a role. It's interesting. A lot of people hold a grudge a really long time. I, I'm I'm guilty of that. I'll hold on to a grudge for a minute. <laughs> yeah, a minute Good for a minute, you know, an hour, maybe too long. Um, so, where are we? Um, where are we looking to take things this next year with this podcast? Uh, well, with the podcast, I think I think within the next year we can get some really great guests on. Um, get some guys that have been there, done that, um, who we can learn some things from, and who our audience can learn some things from. And uh, you know, no bullshit. Just uh, 
talk about problems problems of the day and and the way that we can all you know help each other and, and get through it and and the way that we as individuals can can get through things and and uh just you know cover all the bases yeah i know i'd like to have as many perspectives on here as right. possible right. and the last thing i want is for this to become an echo chamber where we're talking about yeah, right. all the things we agree on right right and i think what's so lost in the media today is some real honest discussion yeah there's no honest discussion in the media today whether it's on the left the right down the center they're all they're all selling you some some shit Yep. Questions are, are rubbish, queued up. as they would say in, in Scotland. Rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything's uh, teed up. Everything's slanted. Uh, extremely biased one way or another, uh, depending on what you listen to. And I'd love to get some guests in here where we can just really lay it all out and have a, a real right. discussion like normal people. And from times on the radio, times on TV, I can tell you, yeah, I never really felt like you could get that out there because it was going to get edited. You know, you might have right. uh, what you thought was a great statement get cut in half and turned into something that uh, it absolutely wasn't. Yeah, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. So I, I think this can be a place where we can have those honest discussions, and I'm looking forward to having guests in from all walks of life, all different professions, um, political, financial, business leaders, yep. uh, construction industry, you know, throw in some wine and food and, you know, all the finer things in life. All the good shit. Yeah. yeah all the, all that good stuff. Uh, you know, I love spending time outside up, definitely up at my place in the UP. And, right. uh, it's funny, you know, what it's, uh, like when you can block out that noise. And, You're right. You know, I have my spot, my Island up in the UP. I don't want to name by name for the whole world to hear, at least at this point. Uh, I like the real estate prices and the taxes where they are right now. Right, so, right. But, you know, being bored up there, uh, I, I've come to uh, to welcome it. Right, that's not boredom. That's meditation, just quiet. Yeah. I know that's, uh, you have some places like that. Uh, in my pickup truck, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Every day. Right. Every day. Cruising down the road, listening to absolutely nothing. Um, and then, you know, they go out deer hunting. I rented some property up north and we'll go up there and just, just relax. And, and Yeah, I, I read Matthew McConaughey's book earlier this year, and I, I know uh, that you know I'm a big reader. Yeah, uh, I, I, didn't, was, I didn't get that book, but there's a few. Uh, Green Lights, it was great. And it was probably one that I'd certainly recommend on audio because you get the guy's voice, his inflection uh, right. with everything. And one of his quotes in there is, the best education I've had in my life is to travel. And that kind of struck me. He talks about this trip he took to Australia. Uh, it, it was pretty ridiculous and entertaining. Um, but the, that really got me thinking about some times in my life, you know, a birthright trip I took to Israel where yeah, I, I really gained some perspective. And again, you know, like that recent near-death experience I have, perspective seems to find me when I'm not looking for it or Usually. when I'm when I'm thinking that I don't need it. And um, makes you thankful for the things you got, like right, being right. able to unload the dishwasher. And, yeah, no kidding. Um, I've been to Panama a couple times uh, with my family, and they don't, even, they don't even have dishwashers down there. Hell, half the people there don't have windows. And I've never met a group of happier people. Um, they're nice, they're polite, they're kind, they're, I see the way they interact with one another. I don't think I've seen any angry people in Panama, whereas hell, all you have to do here is go to Tim Hortons and you'll see some woman screaming at the lady behind the counter about her mocha not tasting right. So that's something that you don't experience in those countries just because I think the people are happier. They don't have as much crap to worry about. And that's, you know, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I think the simplicity, they're just, they're just happy they're just happy that today's Tuesday, you know, or happy that today's Wednesday. Yeah. I, I think, or happy to be alive. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and I think that simplicity is something uh, that we lack so much. You know, we talk about, or uh, as the kids say these days, uh, FOMO, uh, the, the fear of missing out. 
Mm. Um, you know, that's a new so, one on me. On social activities, on events that's with your friends, me. Uh, things like that. Uh, I think for me, more so, it's a JOMO or a joy of missing out. Yeah. You know, and, and focusing <laughs> on the things that <laughs> right. focusing on the right. things that actually matter, uh, and not always constantly striving to um, be a part of everything. Right. Because if you're a part of everything, then uh, what can really become a priority at that point? So it's interesting to see where we are today. I think uh, you know, one of the themes um, for this show is, hey, maybe guys who watch a little too much Yellowstone or feel like they were born in the wrong generation. Um, right. I, I certainly right. would love to uh, experience a time uh, without cell phones, without TV, uh, as we're doing a podcast, ironically. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, where things were just simpler and you could focus on what really mattered and I know that time in the hospital, hey, I'm laying in that, that bed, tethered to a bunch of machines, and um, my biggest event of the day was getting up to go to the bathroom, right? Right. So things get really simple uh, at that stage, and there's only so much Law & Order you can watch, so much uh, daytime TV, so much you can scroll through on the Internet, or uh, football games you can speculate on. And you're just left with your thoughts. And again, what's actually important? Yep. 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 That's and that's and that's that's a tough thing to focus on in today's world. It really, really is for a lot of people, myself included. Myself included. Yeah. Me too. I, I find myself complaining to myself often yeah. about things that uh, problems I should be thankful to have. Yeah, no kidding. Right? And, you know, I have prospects or clients come in, and ultimately my goal is just to really help people align their actions with their intentions. I think, for the most part, people want to do the right thing, and they don't necessarily always know the best way to get there. And helping them align what they're actually doing uh, with where they actually want to get to. Right. It, it's a bigger hurdle. Right. What a good, a good quote. I can't remember who it came from now, but, um, it, you know, you have to, you have to not do, not do what you want right now, do what you want most. And, and I think a lot of people have a disconnect between what they want right now and what they want the most. Yeah. I, I have a friend who, uh, attributes a quote. I think it was to his uncle or his grandfather. Of, Why are you taking all day to do a job you don't want to do? Right. So, Along those similar lines, sometimes I think you just have to rip the Band-Aid off. I'm guilty of it. You know, we're all guilty of it. Yeah, me too. I've got a stack of paperwork waiting for me on my desk right now. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't checked my emails. Uh, well, I have, but, I mean, they come in and just never stop. So, you know, you have to find those pauses, I think, to, again, focus on uh, reset. What, what really matters and reset and uh, find the silver linings and uh, the lessons and things uh, that may have really sucked in the moment. But if you can look back on it and say, hey, wow, look at what I learned from that. Yeah, everything's a lesson. Yeah. Everything's a that lesson. That mistake I made, I, I actually at this point in my life um, wouldn't change it, right? Wouldn't be the same person. Yep, absolutely. Wouldn't change any of it. Wouldn't change any of it, but. So what were some of the biggest challenges you faced um, with uh, your business starting out? Um, starting out was probably, well, honestly, the first thing that happened to me that was a huge, huge, huge punch in the stomach was I learned about payroll taxes very, very, very <laughs> quickly. Um you know, you bid a job, you know how much material you're going to use, you know how much hours you're going to have into it, and all your labor and all that. Get down to the end of it, and then uh, I signed with a payroll company for direct deposit and things like that. And I also signed up to where I could have, you know, all my taxes and insurance taken out week by week so that I would never get behind on it. Well, I remember that first week of payroll I ran, and I'm, I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm in trouble because I had four or five jobs lined up mm -hmm. off of, labor numbers based on no clue about workman's comp or payroll taxes. So 
that was a huge hurdle right up front. <laughs> yeah, that uh, taxes aren't fun. No, no. Yeah. Uh, I'm never going to change my opinion. Yeah, I never like people stealing my money. It's <laughs> never good. Well, it, it's good to plan to pay. Uh, yes, as plan theft. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, can you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> uh, it's 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 my money. I can use it better than they can. I can right. My employees can use it better than they can, and uh, yeah. Yeah, without question. Save that. Save that for later. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I'd love to hear more about that at some point. I know uh, when I started in in the business that I'm in, my first nine appointments canceled. Uh, I was mm. 18 years old when I started my practice. People said, what do you know about finance? Uh, right, I can imagine. And in my industry, you typically work with people uh, 10 years within your age group, up or down. So when you're 18, you know, you're not working with a lot of eight-year-olds. And a lot of 28-year-olds really don't care about your opinion. Right, right. So, you know, it was interesting. Nine appointments canceled. Uh, I'm thinking to myself, the attrition rate in this industry is higher than just about any. Um, and I think about quitting all the time, uh, I th even to this day, probably a couple hundred times a year. Um, but I don't quit. And I think ultimately that's what separates um, being so successful. From that. Yeah, you can't quit. Can't quit. Whether whether you're in too far to quit or whether it's just a really shitty day, shitty month, shitty week, you yeah. quit and and that's that's a failure. So I'm looking forward to less failures and more successes coming coming up here uh, this year, 2022. Um, we're gonna have a lot of interesting guests. We're hopefully gonna entertain you and uh, our audience and and educate a little bit as much as possible. Uh, on at least what not to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, that's, <laughs> and you right. can check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Between Whiskey and Ammonia. And all that information can be found uh, in the show links of this episode. And hopefully you'll tune in next week and, you know, we'll see what we've got. It should be good. Should be good. I'm looking forward to looking forward to spreading some good information and, and also receiving some good information. Amen to that. Yep. Cheers, my friend. Cheers.